Hello everybody, I'm Nick and recently I've been browsing LinkedIn quite a bit and I've noticed that there's tons of people out there creating images or posts to give you tips and tricks or advice on C Sharp and .NET and I've noticed that a lot of it is wrong. In this video what I want to do is take some of those examples, explain why that given advice is wrong and then let you know what's the proper way of doing it. Now for me the biggest problem with this is that the LinkedIn algorithm will basically promote anything and because people watching those posts and especially junior developers don't know any better or don't validate them they get pushed everywhere and they're being perceived as the right way so i want to use my platform to just explain some of those none of this is an attack on the creators themselves actually all of the creators i'm going to showcase have put out good advice as well but if something is just objectively wrong or is too far away from what we consider the norm for a given situation then i do want to talk about it if you like that content and you want to see more make sure you subscribe for more training check out my courses on domtrain.com now quick announcement before i move on we have a brand new course on domtrain called getting started with domain driven design that has been one of the most requested topics for courses on domtrain and is finally here and is authored by the excellent educator and content creator Amikai month in month. And in case you don't know, Amikai has his own YouTube channel, link in the description, give him a sub, but he's also a software engineer in Microsoft whose code powers technologies behind things like Microsoft Office, so literally hundreds of millions of users a month use the stuff he writes. He's an expert on the topic and he actually runs training like that in Microsoft as well, so you're getting the highest quality possible, which is what I wanted to offer with Dome Train in the first place. Now to celebrate the launch, I'd like to offer the first 500 of you a 20% discount code on the course, so use code DDD20 at checkout to claim it, and trust me when I say these do go quick, so if you want to buy it, buy it now. Also, if you buy this Getting Started DDD course, you will also get a special discount code when the deep dive and advanced versions of this DDD course are around so you can double dip in discounts. All right, enough with that, back to the video. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is actually this one. You're going to see this sort of scheme quite a bit where you have the bad way of doing things and the good way of doing things or the way of doing things and then some benchmarks to prove the point. I do that as well in the videos, but the results are only as valuable as your ability to write good benchmarks. And in this case, we have a situation where we don't have enough context. The other reason why I don't think this format actually works is that it doesn't really allow you to give enough context in this situation. In any case, so what do we have here is the left, which is split, substring, and slice, and to prevent allocations and then low CPU usage and cost savings money emoji is to pass the incoming string as a read-only span and then slice it. Now, here's where this becomes interesting and why I think this is bad advice. All of these snippets accept a string and return a string. And there's nothing wrong with writing a method that accepts a read-only span of characters because we actually have an implicit operator when you pass down a string as a read-only span of characters to automatically convert it. So that part is fine, but the problem is in what we return because you can't return a string on every situation and try to prove a point when you're returning read-only span for the efficient result because read-only span is not a string it's just a pointer to a string meaning that if you actually need to use it and the thing you need to use it with doesn't support a read-only span you're going to allocate it anyway because it will be converted into a string. So this is basically completely useless because it doesn't really prove anything. It will be more valuable if you actually converted the return type into a string to see what's the slicing of that span that's coming in actually returns in reality. So something like this doesn't really add any value because it doesn't really test what you want it to test. There's a point to be made here with this example where it's like, okay, if I accept it as a read-only span, is there a difference even if I still return it as a string? But since we don't return that and we return a pointer to something, yeah, you won't have any allocations because you don't create anything because you don't have a string at that point. Span is an awesome type and I've contributed quite a bit in its popularization, but it is not for everything. And if you want to make a point like this, at least showcase it in a way that it deserves to be showcased. Because at this point, it is not a string. It is a representation of what can be a string if that's what you really want to use. Because there's methods that do still accept a read-only span and they eventually do some magic behind the scenes to use it. Now, the next one is interesting because it's actually good advice. I really, really like this piece of advice. 
You don't need auto mapper or any other automatic mapper. That's the whole point. And instead, you can use an extension method on the object you want to map. In this case, you have this on a game and then manually map it. So you can do game.asdto to convert it using that extension method. I actually really, really like this approach. However, the problem with this advice is the naming. Because when you say as something, that has meaning in C Sharp. Let's go on the ID to explain what I mean. Let's say I go here in this program.cs and I have these weather summaries. If I go and I say summaries dot, I have a few methods. And you might have noticed that if I say dot as something, you have as read only, as enumerable, as memory, as parallel, and as queryable, and as span. As means something very specific, especially in the BCL. It is casting, it is not allocating. So by naming this as DTO, you're saying cast this to a DTO. But what we're doing here is not casting. We're creating a whole new object. And we actually do have a naming convention for this in C Sharp. You probably know it. It's the two, two array, two dictionary, two list, two lookup. All of those things will reallocate a whole new type of an array, a dictionary, a list. They're not casting it because we can actually see the difference. If I say as read only, you're going to see that here we have an extension and we're taking that I list object and we are just creating a new read only collection that just points to the real one. There is no new allocation. It's effectively a form of casting. However, if I go and I say to list over here, then you're going to see very quickly when this decompiles that a whole new list object will be created and then those objects will be added. In this case, we have an example of a where clause being turned into a list because they optimize based on different operations. You don't need to know about that. But basically, to is allocation as is casting. It's the same way that when you have sort of a, a try something method, try parse or whatever, you expect it to return a boolean and have an out parameter. They just standardized BCL naming conventions and it's good if we use them in the same way because if I just looked at as DTO, I'm assuming it is casting it, I'm just assuming it is reallocating it. So the advice per se is good, but this should be to DTO, not as DTO. And if I was to name this, I would just name this map to DTO to be very specific about what is happening here. It is very explicit about it being a mapping operation. Now, the third one is interesting because it's sort of a mix of good and bad advice, but it removes all the context that would make that advice good in the first place. And I want to give that context here. So the advice is do not store the HTTP context in a field in ASP.NET Core using it or I assume it means use it only within the scope of the method or block of code that requires it. So we have an invoice service here. We have the HTTP context as a field and we get it from the HTTP context accessor, which I don't know about you, but I feel every time I'm using it that I'm doing something wrong or something hacky as if I should not be getting the context from that class. But that's besides the point or maybe a story for a different video. But the good advice is inject the IHTP context accessor and then get it every time you need it in the method. Now, the argument here is that each thread gets its own instance and that's thread safe. Now, here's why I don't like this advice, and I'm actually going to show you why. The problem I have with this advice is that there's actually no context because you don't know and the post doesn't tell you how is the invoice service register independency injection? Because this advice is completely invalid if you register it as a transient or as a scoped. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to register this invoice service as a singleton, and then I'm going to basically hack my way in here and get the query string as a parameter in this uh, weather result. So just to quickly show you what I mean, I'm just going to leave this as it is and inject the HTTP context and then run this. And I'm going to call this endpoint with a query string city equals Athens. So you can see the query string here. Now, if I go and I change this query string to London, because that is a singleton, what's going to happen is the service will actually throw an exception because what I've stored here in this field is that old request, which is now disposed. It will even be impossible to get in a situation that this is a problem because this would never actually run. So that invalidates half the advice. And of course, just to prove a point, if I turn this into a scoped because the requests are scoped as well, if I run this API real quick and I go and I say London over here, you get London. And if I say Athens, then Athens is here because that is now instantiated per request. So it is perfectly fine to have the HTTP context as a field over there if the service is scoped or transient. This advice is only valid if indeed you do want to have the service registered as a singleton. And if you do that, then yes, you're going to have to do something like this where you say HTTP context. Um, and if I do something like that and I turn this into um, a singleton, then this will make this approach work because now the call is in the method. 
However, this doesn't really mean anything. And the use case for this is very narrow. The only reason why you wouldn't want to do this is because the instantiation of this class is very heavy and you want to keep it in memory throughout the application with whatever that means in terms of implications. My biggest problem with this advice is there is no context and it is just advice for the sake of advice without really giving any advice. It is just, here's a hypothetical scenario that could never happen and that's what you need to do. Like, you would never do that. Now, these are the three pieces of advice I want to focus on in this video, but now I want to know from you, what do you think about this form of advice without context? And what's your favorite way of actually consuming this content? Is it YouTube, which it probably is because you're here, but maybe what's your second favorite? Is it books? Is it these LinkedIn posts? Is it blogs? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.